So th through this series, I've been um, sharing something of art or poetry every week. And this morning, I just wanted to share with you a song, a beautiful song that actually uh, came to me this morning. The song says, praise the Lord, my heart, my whole life give praise. <clears throat> Let me sing to God as long as I live. Never depend on presidents, governors, senators, mayors, born of earth, they cannot save. They die, they turn to dust. That day, their plans crumble. <clears throat> they are wise who depend on God, who look to the Lord, creator of heaven and earth, maker of the seas. <clears throat> the Lord himself keeps faith forever, giving food to the hungry, justice to the poor, freedom to captives. The Lord opens blind eyes, and straightens the bent, comforting widows and orphans, protecting the stranger. The Lord loves the just, but blocks the path of the wicked. Smoky Hill Vineyard, praise the Lord. Your God reigns forever from generation to generation. Hallelujah. It's a paraphrase of Psalm 146. That's the song today. That's actually the daily reading <laughs> for today. Isn't that a beautiful paraphrase? I threw in the Smoky Hill Vineyard part at the end. But God's word is so powerful and so impacting. It's important as we gather together to pray for our leaders, to pray for our city, to pray for schools, kids, faculty, staff. It's important to pray for law enforcement. It's important to pray for those in government. It's important to pray for our leaders. This week, um, I had a meeting with the mayor of Aurora, along with the pastor from Flatirons and another, part of our, another guy that's a part of our church. We had a beautiful meeting. I'd not met this mayor. He took over last spring because our mayor died. And so he was kind of put into this place of being the mayor of our city. And he, not really a position that he's wanted, and he's only serving through the end of the term, which is 2019. I actually love to meet with people in leadership who don't necessarily want to be in a position of leadership. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Whenever you're with somebody who's in, in a position of authority or in politics or something else, and they're doing what they're doing because they have to do it or there's a sense of calling or something like that, it's much more powerful because plus they're not trying to sell you something. And I, we were talking about what is it that you see in our city? What is it that, that we could be praying for you? How as a church and how as local church communities can we support you? How can we, how can we help? And he was sharing different initiatives and things going on. And then he proceeded to share with us about his own spiritual journey and just got tears in his eyes. And it was the most beautiful thing as he shared about encountering Jesus. And, I, and we got toward the end of the lunch and asked him, you know, what was most impactful or again, what could we be helping with? And he said, he says, you know, the thing that's most impacting to me is when you guys made the comment that as churches, you're doing missions all over the world, but the greatest mission field is here right in our city that we're responsible for. And he just looked at me with tears in his eyes when he said that. And it was like something just was grabbing him. And so I'd encourage you to pray for our mayor and pray for those in our city and realize that you know, I, I'm not trusting our mayor to change the climate of Aurora. He's not going to, he can't change the weather today. <laughs> but I am, 
I did see something in him that was beautiful. And that was a shepherd's heart because as he started to talk about housing that is affordable for people who can't get into housing, he, he made the statement, we talk about how we have affordable housing in Aurora, but it's not really affordable in reality and something needs to change. And I was like, that's, that's the heart right there. It's a beautiful thing. So how can we do that? So let, will you pray with me about that for our city? Some of you are nodding and some of you are like, I don't know if I want to pray for that. But would, you, would you join me in praying? Just is, is it, Anyway, God is at work in our city. And I'm thankful to be partnering with others in that. We're in Mark chapter 12 today. <clears throat> the title of the message is Make Room for the Scriptures and the Power of God. Can you say that with me? Make room for the scriptures and the power of God. One more time. Make room for the scriptures and the power of God. Let's pray. Lord, we bow before you and the authority of your word, your spoken word. Jesus, you are the word. Would you make it real to us? And we want to make room, Lord, for your word and for your power, not just in what we give assent to, but in our real lives, Lord, in the heart of who we are, we want to make room in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark 12, beginning at verse 18. And Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. The Sadducees, let me hit pause here. But just, the Sadducees were a small, smaller group they were the aristocratic group. They were the most wealthy. The high priest was always, except with one exception over all of the generations, was a Sadducee. The Sadducees differed from the Pharisees. The Sadducees believed that the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, were authoritative. They didn't rely much on the rest of Scripture, and they for sure did not adhere to the traditions of the elders and that the rulers in Israel were a part of. So you get, there's an angry Sadducee portrayed right there. And, and so they were upset at Jesus because he was upsetting the power structure. It's interesting to note that Jesus, that's scary, isn't it? It's like, how many of you want to hang out with that guy? I don't think so. Jesus had a tendency to go at people where they were most prideful. So these Sadducees come to him and they're very proud. They, they, they pray the scripture. They, many of them have memorized the first five books of the Bible. They were considered authority figures on, those, on the scripture. Their lack of a belief in the resurrection wasn't, be, for most of us, we hear that and we go, well, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Man, they were really out of it. No, it's because they were holding to the first five books of the scripture and they believed that when you died, you went to the place of the dead and that there was no resurrection that came. I can't go into great detail on it, but there, there were reasons behind that belief. However, they come to Jesus and they're going to try to trick him. How many of you know it's not a good idea to trick Jesus, try to trick Jesus? To, to like show that you're smart. So they bring to Jesus this huge exaggerated example in order to trap him about the resurrection and about the scripture. Verse 19, teacher, Moses... Remember back in the first five books of the Bible who Moses was considered to have authored? Wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Okay, so this was something culturally that was very important. If a woman's husband died, it was expected if one of the brothers was not married that he would marry her, not to be some weird sort of family thing, but because, but because they wanted to continue the family line. And it was to protect the woman and her property. So, so two good motives, right, for that? 
So the Sadducees, though, are coming trying to trick Jesus, and they say, a man's brother dies, leaves a wife, leaves no child. The man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, which they didn't believe in, by the way, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. <laughs> you know, I love that Jesus is never confounded by crazy questions. He's not going, oh my gosh. <laughs> I love that Jesus with the Pharisees, he takes the gloves off and he goes right at them in the area of them having no mercy. And with the Sadducees, this group, he takes the gloves off and he goes right after their unbelief and their lack of faith. And he actually uses the scripture to do it. Verse 24, Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Wow, seriously? You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. They prided themselves in knowing the scripture, right? They read the Bible way more than most of us, right? They were totally familiar with the scriptures, and yet he says, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And then he, in, in a very unusual situation, not like Jesus, he didn't do this all the time, but he addresses it specifically, verse 25. When they rise from the dead, they neither, neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. I don't have time to go into all the detail of that and what he meant by that but you can look it up and you can study. I think it's good to study that. Jesus is saying that what you've imagined heaven to be like, it's not going to be like that. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush? You see what Jesus is doing here? He's saying, okay, you guys, you are all about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Let's go back to Exodus. Have you not read, and this is Exodus chapter 3, Jesus goes back to the scriptures that they're using as their authority. Have you not read in the book of Mo Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Now I read that. And rather than getting really smug about it and going, yeah, those guys are stupid. I go, oh my gosh, God, forgive me for being prideful. God, have mercy on me that when I think I understand something in your word, in fact, you can read the scripture day and night and miss out on the God of the word. You can go through all sorts of stuff in your life of ritual, of reading the scripture and never have the word really come and take up residence in your heart and direct your life. You can miss out on the power of God. I love this challenge from Jesus because he quotes the scripture and then he gives a new understanding. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not a God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, everything that you've hung your hats on, you've missed it. He's the God of the living and not the dead. 
How many of you have had an experience like that? I know I've had, I've had many of them where it's like the lights come on and you realize, oh my gosh, I was so stupid in that area. I thought that was the most important thing. And then I realized God brought new insight into the scripture that maybe my heart, I hadn't made room for him. This is important for us. Jesus says, it's, is, not this, is this not the reason you're wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? And I also like the message translation of this. It says, you're way off base and here's why. One, you don't know your Bibles. Two, you don't know how God works. Put it this way, because many, many in the room here today, it's not like you're walking around going, I know the Bible. I know up front to back. I've memorized most of the scripture. No, that's not typically the issue in our culture. We need more memorizing of the scripture and more of the word in our hearts. But, but I think if Jesus were to come to many of us, he would come at us in the area that we take pride in. And maybe it's your compassion. Maybe you're like, you know what? I don't know all of the Bible, but I'm kind to people and I try to do my best to be a good person and to show kindness to people and to be a giving person. And it, and it would be as though Jesus came to you and said, you know nothing of compassion. <gasps> what? And instead of defending ourselves, we would say, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on me. Let your compassion work in and through me. Lord, and, and in a moment, Jesus can bring before your mind's eye in your own thoughts all of the situations where you choose not to have compassion. How many of you have experienced that before? I have. And so rather than condemning yourself, you agree with Jesus and say, Lord, just change my heart. I want to make room in my heart for the scriptures and for your power. Jesus deeply wounds the Sadducees. As a follower of Jesus, this is kind of like, to use a baseball analogy, which is a little depressing in Colorado because we're out of the playoffs, but the playoffs are still going on. To use a baseball analogy, it's like as a follower of Jesus, every day you have to stand up and stand up in the batter's box and stand up to the plate. Follow me so far? And as you go through life, there are going to be sweeping curveballs that are going to come in to the plate. And you have a decision to make with every sweeping curveball. And by sweeping curveball, I mean something that would normally cause you to jump out of the box and go, oh my God, oh, and freak out. Something that somebody would say. So what if, if you love God so much, where is he with all the suffering in the world? Curveball. If you say you love God, then why are you people who follow Jesus, why are you so bigoted? Curveball. If you say you love Jesus, why is there so much hypocrisy in the church? Why is it all that you guys talk about is money? Why is it that you hate people that Jesus loves? Why is it that you don't look anything like, anybody face a curveball before? Why is it you believe the Bible? That's just written by a bunch of men. It's been translated a million times and it's all so different and blah, 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 blah. And I'm telling you at that moment, at that moment and here's what I wanna encourage you with this morning, you don't have to swing at every pitch. You don't have to feel like, oh my gosh, I can tell you the answer to that. Just humble yourself and be patient. You don't have to answer everything. Go back to the scripture, study, pray. It's okay to say, to pass on that pitch. Go, I don't know. I'm not really sure. You know what? It bothers me that sex trafficking is spreading and it's increasing. It bothers me that there's racial hatred in our country. It bothers me. It bothers me to know in that people are suffering. And I don't have any great answers to that. 
it's okay to not swing at every pitch. Hello. It's okay to identify with people and go, yeah, that stinks. It's okay to agree and go, you know what? Yeah, I can tell you for myself. I'm not, I can't speak for everybody else in local church community, but I can tell you I tend to be judgmental. I'll agree with you. I tend to look down on other people. I tend to think that I'm right in most situations. I'll agree with you on that. Rather than being so stinking arrogant and feeling like we have to, with every situation, giving an answer for the hope that is in you as the scripture calls us to do, does not mean swinging at every curveball and being so arrogant, being willing to humble ourselves as followers of Jesus. How many of you with me this morning would own that at some level, we don't know the scriptures fully nor the power of God? That's starting point. That's the starting point. This room is filled with people who are with me in that. We would admit that. I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you where I find peace. I can tell you where I put my trust. I can tell you where I take my frustrations and it brings me some solace and consolation. I can tell you what I've learned to pray, that I'm, not, I'm no expert on this, but I'm trying to follow Jesus. See, I want you to hear this this morning. Following Jesus is not about a contractual arrangement. It's about covenant. Contractual arrangement means that here's the contract we'd have agreed to. I, can, I sign up and I, I've checked off on all those beliefs. But when you sign up for a contract, all you're really responsible to do is pay the bottom line and then it's done, right? But when you sign up for covenant, you say, I'm going to walk with you, Jesus. And this isn't about the bare minimum. This is actually grace is about everything. Right? He turned to the religious leader when they said, you know, Lord, I want to call, come and follow you. And he said, the foxes, of the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, You think you know the scripture, but can I find rest in you? This is about covenant. It's about transformation. And it's how we treat the Bible, how we treat the scripture. If you have the scriptures without power, you're going to dry up. You'll get into legalism and it ends up in death. And if you have power without the scripture, you'll blow up. You get off the rails. There's no banks for the river. It's just Jesus lived by the word of God. What's the filter in your life? Do you have a hunger this morning to know, experientially know the scriptures and the power of God? And let me just use this illustration. I'm borrowing some of this language from Conrad Gimpf, who he's a professor of, uh, at the London School of Theology. I love Conrad's stuff. And, and he, he used the analogy. He, he said this. He said, as a follower of Jesus, many people are, you're either like Batman or you're like Superman. And... And Jesus, by the way, does not call us to be like Batman. And let me just paint the picture for you. Followers of Jesus who are like Batman, their mentality is that they want to separate out what's relevant in the Bible, the likable parts of it, from the irrelevant parts of life. They hope to sanitize it, organize it, and memorize those parts so that whatever problem they face in life or in somebody else's life, they'll be able to pull out the right bit of scripture and bam. 
all fixed. Batman is nobody special. He just works hard and he's rich. He's got stuff. If he needs to hit something at a distance, he can throw a batarang. If he's confronted with poison gas, he's got a bat gas mask. And they're all in compartments in his belt. He spends quiet times in the bat cave loading up his belt with the stuff he thinks will be relevant for the coming day. And then when he assesses the situation, he pulls out the right bat tool and bam, problem fixed. You have a problem in life? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lonely on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. You're having a problem with faith. And I'm quoting scripture, by the way. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you're struggling in your life and you're feeling hopeless, like you've been going through hard times, now God works everything together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Are you lacking? With, oh, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach. Boom. I've got that. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And for some of you, you bought into a version of following Jesus that involves whipping out scripture as though you're somebody like Batman in every situation where what's most needed is for you to pull out the right thing to fix it. That isn't what it means to follow Jesus. When Jesus healed people, he did not, Jesus quoted scripture all the time, but when he healed people, he didn't go back to chapter and verse and say, I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. I heal all of your diseases. He didn't go back and do that. He didn't go back and quote, by his stripes you are healed. You know what he did? The word came out of him in the moment. It was who he was. Here's the difference between Batman and Superman. Excuse me, Spider-Man and Superman. Actually, it really only plays applies to Spider-Man. Spider-Man didn't want to be a crime fighter at all. One day he was bitten by a radioactive or genetically modified spider, depending on how old you are. <laughs> he got bitten and he was transformed. He started sticking to things. Goop started shooting out of his wrists. Those things don't seem really that relevant to crime fighting, but you know, he does pretty well. He doesn't wear a belt full of relevant stuff. He uses his power and his brains and he becomes the way to fix the problem. Too many try to be like Batman, stuff the relevant verses into the compartments of your utility belt. God doesn't use scripture that way. His word does not fit into your compartments. It bites you and you change. And you don't just share relevant verses, you become relevant. Not because you're following a recipe, but because you're conforming to a pattern you've internalized by soaking in the scripture. You're making room for the scriptures and the power of God. The pattern of Jesus, it's the pattern yesterday, today, and forever. In the Old Testament, the new pattern, the New Testament, the pattern is that God has shown up in Jesus. Unless he's already with you, you're not going to meet him through books about philosophy. You're not going to meet him in meditation. You're not going to meet him through other avenues. You might encounter him there if you're seeking. This is where we meet him. And as Conrad Gimp says, this is the source book for philosophers or else they scheme in vain. This is the source book for theologians or else they're just repeating they're either or beliefs, insider, outsider language. Jesus said, is this not the reason you're wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And as Peter Kreft said, another theologian, 
How do you get grace? How do you get grace the same way you get wet? You don't do it yourself. God does it. But you have to go where God is just as you have to go outside in the rain to get wet. Reading and praying the Bible is putting yourself in the way. Standing in God's great waterfall of living water. If you stand in the street, you'll get hit by a truck. If you stand in God's word, you'll get kissed by God. And I love this. The scripture is the mistletoe of God. Man, if that doesn't make you hungry to know more of God's word, to know the scriptures and the power of God, that in all of your questions, you don't have to swing at every pitch. In all of your questions, you can yield to Jesus. You can actually step out of the box and go, hold on a second, I need to. <laughs> you can get some coaching. That we all start in the same place. And let's make room. I'm telling you, I believe God wants to do amazingly powerful things, more than we've seen to date. Any of us. Make some room. Stand under the waterfall this week. And you may go, I don't feel any water. I don't feel anything. Whatever. This isn't about what you feel. Get into his word. Let it get into you and humble yourself. That's the ground which causes fruit to come. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful this morning for your word and the power of it. The power of it to change our lives. And we just confess the many ways that we end up being kind of like Batman and that we approach your scripture as a, something that we want to use in situations. And Lord, we want, we want to come to your word as, as living word, Lord, that would be living and active and divide soul and spirit, just come to the innermost parts of who we are. And Lord, in the situations we live in, Lord, I pray this for each one here. God, give us a greater hunger for your word and for your power. In Jesus' name.